Thank you so much for this very generous, multifaceted um, talk, Akhil. Um, since we have fallen a little bit behind in schedule, I'm just going to move uh, without further ado to uh, our two uh, guests that are joining for the forum discussion so that we will still have some time um, for uh, a broader of to actually receive some questions from um, our many visitors, uh, listeners today. So I'd like to first ask Sabina, Sabina Haag, um, for her presentation. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. Welcome. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, first of all, I will switch to German in a second, but I would like to first of all thank, thank you, Achille, for your um, talk and inspiring lecture. And I hope I can add some further, clo as close as well, possible inspirations to what you just um, said. Once again, sorry, uh, Sabine, to interrupt. Just for yeah. those who might have uh, who might have joined later, um, mm -hmm. Sabine is going to talk in German, in the German, but there is an English, French, and Spanish translation accessible um, via the globe symbol uh, for interpretations. And I understand also on other forms of the, on the live stream as well, um, but I can't verify that right now. So um, just as a quick note, thanks. Good. Also, uh, vielen Dank. Right. Thank you again, Achille, for the f for your input, which was very comprehensive and very inspiring. Uh, basically, all I can say is I agree completely, and I also agree that uh, the re repairing the world, reinventing the world, is a task that we all share. And May Césaire once said we need to reinvent the world on the scale of the world. And I think that is something that came out very clearly in your input as well. But that means, I believe, that we have to understand that we are approaching this task from very difficult different geopolitical uh, positions, and that uh, characterizes how we tackle this task. So I'll take the next 10 minutes to talk about this a little bit. I'm speaking here primarily as a feminist, uh, queer, activist, uh, theoretician positioned in the global north who is privileged in quite a few uh, ways, not last because she happens to hold a chair um, and is a public servant at a university. Um, this role of uh, knowledge and uh, critical theory and in re reinventing the world is something I've given a lot of thought to. I have a new uh, book also c about the community of the unelected. And in this connection, I'm very um, pleased to hear about the role that a knowledge should play. Achille also spoke about the archives as tapping into new archives different archives, archives that already exist, otherwise they wouldn't be archives, in order to uh, drive the, the, the reconstruction of the world. For me, talking about critical theory also means that we also must uncover domination in the categories with which we access and interpret the world. Race and gender, for instance, are two of the central categories we use to access and interpret the world. And we must uncover dominance in um, the shapes in which it presents itself. And for us, for those who consider themselves to be critical, uh, th theorists, that means that we also have to uh, look to those categories and terms that we ourselves use to describe the world and that we use to understand the world. Uh, racified, uh, sexist, misogynistic, homo, trans, and crip hostile ways of writing, for instance, must be rejected. Um, Theodore Adorno once called it in negative dialectics that we uh, must show ourselves resistant against that which is imposed on it. We need to examine and deconstruct epistemic violence. Second thing I'd like to do applies to the history of violence. Uh, the 
history of violence, the transformation of people, of their bodies, and what belongs to them and is sacred to them in whatever sense into globally circulated raw material must no longer be denied. The history of the denial of equality must become real. That may seem something that is straightforward, but I believe uh, colonialism, the colonialist state, is characterized by that very denial of uh, this history of violence and the denial of equality. Not least, this history of a denial of equality is also represented in every single ethnological artifact that is displayed in a museum in Berlin, Paris, London, Madrid, or Lisbon. The story of violence, dispossession, alienation, and reification must be told and heard, not just for the sake of sheer storytelling, nor because repair should feed the illusion that violence can be undone, that all trauma can be healed, but quite simply because we owe it to each other. Bearing witness in all circumstances, telling the story. This is how James Baldwin described the task of the writer to observe and to report. There is one aspect of epistemic violence that I'd like to address specifically. It is the privilege that is based on this violence of those in dominance. Those in dominance do not have to consider those they dominate. They do not owe anything to those they dominate. They don't have to care for them. They don't have to know them. They don't have to uh, consider them, take them into account, as Elsa Dolan has said. It is also a privilege, Dolan writes, that gives rulers time to themselves because they do not have to know about others. They do not have to consider their lives. It's an expression of an asymmetrically structured moral economy that allows those in dominant social positions to know themselves, love themselves, listen to themselves, cultivate themselves. Nothing but this, to celebrate dominance culture through the chance, in other words, not to have to know about the distress of others and to be able to tune out the role that race and gender play in the structuring of the world and knowledge. So, with this complex overhang of intertwined dominant structures when we encounter each other as unequals as regards our positions. That also means that this uh, reparation work cannot be begun on seeing eye to eye. Uh, a great number of liberal thinkers, as Achille has said, see this as a symmetrically constructed space of mutuality. It, what is needed is more, maybe something that is very different from just agreeing on uh, standards that are considered civil. And of course, these standards would have to be examined for uh, their narrative content. Clearly, there are moral positions also that have to be considered. An imperial way of living has to be unlearned. We have to say actively no to socialization and dominance that we have learned over centuries. And that requires something that is different from uh, acting as a political citizen on the basis of a history that was formed over centuries. Uh, a revolution by the citizen 2.0 will not be enough. This would be a project of the bourgeois elites and of white uh, cisgendered heterosexual men. What the repair or the reconstruction of the world is about against this backdrop seems fairly clear to me. One is that we have to unlearn the dominance culture and we have to move away from wanting to rule. Racist ideology, for instance, 
of the identitarian movement is one example. And we can also not rely on neoliberal mantras where each and every person is just responsible for him or herself and not for others. As little as this can mean the ultimately nostalgic revival of normalized collectives, homogeneous in whatever respect, even ethnically coded, it will be just as little done with promoting uh, pacified, embedded versions of liberalism. After all, these are only able to think of our bond with each other as contractually rela regulated relationship of supposedly sovereign and self-disposing subjects because they do not consider that capitalism for decades has been based on what Jason Moore calls the seven cheap things, nature, money, work, care, food, energy, and life. I'd like to summarize from an intellectual point of view, this is about certainties that are being undermined. It is about uh, giving account, being accountable in this project of reconstruction, even though we are entwined in categories of dominance. And the political task is that we have to redesign against all odds to redraft, because it is possible to start new things, to set things in motion, as Hannah Arendt has said before, because it is possible for us to start over. We can get up and leave. We can make a new world begin simply by putting it into practice. This is how the Guerriere put it in uh, a breathtakingly wild novel written by Monique Wittig called Les Guerrières. It was published in 1960. And they are free because they practice freedom, not because freedom is ontologically given to them. It is because they speak to each other and act with one another, because they expose themselves physically to one another, because they are interdependent. To follow the guerrilla year and to shape the new democratic sociality that makes possible an egalitarian life with others, to find an exit from the monadically structured colonial melancholy into which we have settled and to uh, take our self-inflicted and never realized losses and cling to them, first and foremost, the loss of a shared world and the ability to let ourselves be touched by others, to care for them, unlearning our privileges by recognizing that they already embody the loss of a world shared with all, as uh, Gayatri Spivak says, unlearning one's privilege as one's loss. Working on non-nostalgic designs of communality that actively renounce resentment and enmity, founding an ethos of living together in which freedom and care are not antipodes but become real together and awaken from the dream about ourselves. This is what needs to be done now from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sabine Haag, for this response, which was just great. Behind in scheduling and preserving some of our common discussion time, I'd like to ask, uh, without further ado, um, for the presentation of Yvonne Adiambo Ovour. Um, are you with us? Yes, I see you. We have to unmute you. A very warm welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's such a pleasure, um, and thank you for those who have gone before Sabina, whom I've just encountered, and of course uh, our dear Professor Ashil. Uh, thank you always for being that voice, as you said, which is open to the world and all who inhabit it. Um, uh, just a couple of reflections, and it, it, um, I, um, I've written it so I won't waffle all over the place. Uh, I, will, I will start from the question that you ask, Prof. Uh, how will we carry life on? for everyone and everything, and, and what kind of world um, do we reimagine? Well, discovery, curiosity, creativity, exploring questions, scenarios, and collaborations, the exhilaration of imagining and designing um, a future, and, and reflecting on how, uh, on how we may best live out our Earth. 
adventure aided uh, with the tools of technology that are emerging, emerging and opening up all mysteries. And with daily news of traffic by many nations heading to Mars, uh, we can even allow ourselves music, musings of interplanetary consciousness um, and the hope of some multidimensional thinking. One leaps uh, with great pleasure the chance of, of mulling over cosmological possibilities. Um, I relish the play of ideas of the treasury of the unknown, the insertion of technology, uh, the sense of wonder uh, generated by perhaps a new kind of story making, a new kind of stories that maybe we can trust again, that also return us, thank God, to the foundry of the big questions. What is life? Why are we here? What might we become? If the panel focus had honed, uh, had not honed into repair and reparation, I think my intervention would have leapt off into some stratospheric spheres. Uh, but uh, uh, as the case is, uh, reality check. We find ourselves in a miasma of suffering. A plague stalks our sense of earthly ease, exacerbating our fears, making us not only aware of our vulnerability as beings, as human beings, but also the reality of confronting the entanglements, uh, those that we have spent most of the last 400 years uh, denying some of us more than others. Now we are all forcibly living out a shared human story, much to the extreme discomfort of a few. Weakened, hurting humanity, broken, fragile earth. Repair and reparation sounds about right. These intimations of a human awareness of our debt we owe existence. Acts and duties of reparation are intertwined with reconciliation and atonement. Loaded words, but they only become meaningful in rights of public acknowledgement, apology, restitution or satisfaction, and an intent to transform towards an ideal. There is little mystery about all of these until, of course, these are directed to the worlds that suffered Occidental discovery, particularly Africa, whose existential frameworks are decimated by a marauding culture that finds itself unable to examine its historical conscience and prefers to cavort in the perpetual delusion that there was something holy, meaningful, enlightening and elevating about its eviscerating forays. So reparation, repair, who? The fantasy West, the designated rest? Why, for the present or the future, right? But to which purpose? Now, I, I will make a side note. I'm, I do not like the paradigms of dichotomies. I prefer methods of uh, the interstices, uh, the spaces of blurred in-betweens, right? But I will settle into the, uh, well, the, I will settle into the, the, the preferred dichotomies for this conversation. But what do we actually hold in common uh, that is uncontested, that might allow us the fantasy of a, a shared and equal departure point into the future? Uh, are we even haunted by the same things? One example, in the realm of the unspoken, the West want the rest, primarily Africa, to quickly move on from the past and grow up. I think you think we owe you uh, an imagined uh, 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 debt for the imagined privilege of your alleged light, the alleged light your ancestors shine shone upon our lives in, in, during their visitation. But we, on the other hand, want your mea culpas. We want you to wake up to and give a grammar to the abyss of the unique and gratuitous evil, the intrinsic evil, the meaning of the horror that was your atrocity laid and piercing into our lives and stories so that you can grow up. We bear the overwhelming weight of unresolved histories between us that destabilize the sense of being human. The, the, the consequence is this, the ferocious lust for capital, the violent money grabbing, the scramble, some of your historians called it, that has systematically corroded our human trust, our human spirit, our human soul. Admitting to this would not make us or you less human. 
it was just announced to the inheritors of the wounds that there is now a desire and a capacity to reckon with a cultural pathology, a brokenness that shatters and shattered humanity, humanity, the earth's heart, in the most horrible ways. The past haunts the present. It shapes it. It colonizes it. Would we dare to be so neg neglectful as to proceed with a project of imagined futures without tending to the human wounds? Our histories, no matter where we end up, reliably return as a debt-collecting revenue that is the first to knock on the door of our castles in the air. History, like nature, as you know, abhors a vacuum. What do we do then? We engage our consciences. Note that I did not say consciousness. Repair is arguably the first step um, of a long odyssey that must start with an internal audit, leading to a public acknowledgement of woundedness, of long shadows within. Few cultures have the guts to do that depth of soul work to date, not yours and not ours. For more often than not, it involves grief work to enter into and admit to our losses, our absences, our failures. You and I now inhabit a world where an invisible, unseen, and weapon-defeating virus has confounded our hubris. We live through not only the devastation of peoples, but also of our secure societal absolutes. And uh, I extend my care and solidarity to those who have been most affected by this pandemic. What we in our African worlds have also experienced, on top of all this, is the reactionary macabre despair of far too many of your writers, your scientists and journalists, who lament diabolically that the fact that our African mortality rates are not as high as those elsewhere, and that when our morbidity figures do not tally with the gross date predictions, then the African counting is wrong. Only scavengers, vampires, and necromancers might rival this gruesome necrophilia. Does the culture ever reflect on what it means for a person to traverse the earth and enter into spaces where there will be those fantasizing about their decimation and the decimation of their people? And is also quite oblivious to the hideous preoccupation. I suggest that in the imagination of a new ideal of a planetary consciousness, all our cultures first attempt to repair our souls, their souls, before trying to repair others and the earth itself. There remains between us a huge inner internal abyss separating our spirits, our souls, and our, our ideas. The questions of habitations have only rarely been extended to the landscapes of our innermost beings. Look, it may be too late to attempt to bridge the chasm now, given the reality of the futures, plural, already evolving elsewhere. There is a new generation, a cyborg demographic, I call them, the same ones whom some of your myopic European policy scaremongers delight in presenting as only marking time on real and imagined Mediterranean shores waiting to invade Europe. That generation is mostly already looking within or searching their own imagination for the futures or looking up at the African skies. And if they do look out outward with interest, they look towards Korea, China, Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, Malaysia, India, and even the Middle East. You are aware that China is now the preferred destination for young Africans seeking further education? Strike that, you probably aren't. To be clear, I'm not advocating a detachment from Europe, uh, that we cannot recreate the horror and error of 400 years uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the terrible horror of a human separation ideology. I'm merely asserting that a thorough forensic audit of the long history of Occidentalism is required as part of the processes of reconciling and reimagining the earth. To arrive at a logic of transformative being in, odd, in the order of things, a long view examination of cultural and historical conscience, conscience is a start. We are not the same kind of human being, but this is not the same as saying we have nothing in common. 
the demand for a collectivized uniform human experiencing of reality is as strange as something I heard a few months ago from one of your policymakers, that our African aspiration is to be you, to be like you. Sweet. Our point of departure is generated from our experience of life, of you, our specific negotiations with existence, our sense of what life means for us, our, epistemologi uh, our epistemological values, our response to the question, what does it mean to be human? And its corollary, what does the humanity of the other mean for me? Our replies are different and diverse, but it is nothing to be afraid of. It might instead become a site of mutual exploration and discovery. I feel there's an immense life transformative treasury in the knowledge embedded in our earth and human varieties that the ideal desired also lies somewhere within the amplification of the diverse dimensionalities of our being, where, which the 400 years of living the age of atrocities, I think some of you call it enlightenment or modernity, mm, had turned into a contested hot point through which grievous crimes against the earth, against humanity have been committed and justified. I attend to the soaring ideas put forth by our professor with awe, excitement, and hope, yet in me there is also the ghost of weariness. Historical precedent, you see, that, that, long, that long chime of imperialism, it's out of obfuscation, excuse-making, the chutzpah that turns thieves and land grabbers into heroes and victims. The matrices that are only ever about extraction, control, private possession, commerce, and economics. When I hear the call to futures, my head swivels and I squawk. Who is that? What do they want this time? What, what must die for this idea to live? Who will be forced to change for their own good? Who gains most? Because in the unexamined heart, there is always a profit motive. How is power to be distributed? Who will wield it the most? How? I worry about good intentions that pave the road to hell. The earth is in jeopardy? Yes. It's threatening, it's threatening to burn us to a, to a crisp? Yes. But has anything changed in the mindset, habits, and responses that have led us to this point? No. And what will happen to the alienated, marginalized, overexploited, often ignored, non-human Earth? Do we care? Aid is, aid is a sub-theme of this conference. In brief, the paternalism that still characterizes its imagination and ex execution is problematic. It turns aid into a fig leaf. Given that what has been extracted, seized, robbed from our worlds over the last 400 years uh, in living out this Occidental paradigm, in the words of business, quite frankly, you are in debt to us. The public records of and evidence of crimes of robbery are held in your ethnological museums and collections, the clearing houses for stolen goods containing priceless collections, including human remains, with no rent, apology, or royalties extended. The records of European banks established to capitalize on and profit from so many thieving expeditions, the auction houses that still trade in our commodities from diamonds to coffee, also for which no payments have been received, no royalties received. How about this? a collectivized audited process linked to settling outstanding accounts so that you will no longer bother your hapless populations to contribute the two euros over Christmas. The, the long overdue in the aid game is a process that offers a more dignifying way of engaging with and supporting humans in distress without the tedious virtue signaling and endless propaganda. If our philanthropy had been honest and truthful, this is the time and this is the season where we would have demonstrated Earth solidarity. Instead, what do we have? The lust of anticipatory shareholder profits to be derived from the sales of much needed vaccines. A phrase now enters our world, vaccine nationalism. I highlight this just to underline what a bore hypocrisy is. Accepted, a new epoch of Earth being is emerging anyway. The foment, the unease, the restlessness of the heart, the escalating technologies, and the new ways of interactions, the power shifts. All of these will converge into some sort of resolution with its own grammar. 
It's likely, I think, to be pluriversal, in line with the ideas put forth by thinkers like Quijano and Mignolo et al. Given the scent of present epochal winds, the big shift is also likely to arise from unexpected plots, plot twists in the human story, similar to what this pandemic has engendered. I end on a mischievous note. If the test of futures depends on societal adaptability, resilience, discipline, and the capacity and imagination to innovate, even during an existential crisis, then it can be accurately predicted that if there's any fundamental reordering of the world going to happen, it will bear the imprimatur of the Middle Kingdom of China, for this is also a numbers game. Remembering, it's worth remembering now that the compelling Belt and Road Initiative also already includes a very inclusive planetary consciousness plan. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne, um, for this powerful paper. Um, I think we have somehow a very kind of nuanced um, picture from all three contributions um, about what is perhaps at stake in this kind of quest for both reconstruction and a sort of counter universality um, and the, the very stakes also for intellectual engagement and positionality in it in relation to the history of, of hypocrisy, obfuscation, etc. So I want to just somehow address the entire panel for once um, to maybe make this more tangible um, for some of our listeners in relation to the larger geopolitical picture that we are seeing, especially now in the global north and the, the, um, the rise or reaffirmation of uh, both a, an old, a new and a white supremacist movement, um, often in alliance with a rhetoric of defense of universal values, as we can see both in Germany and perhaps in the past few weeks, in particular in France. And it just seems to me that the broad kind of populace of, of the continent, both in Europe and in a different form in the US, um, is entirely unprepared to understand exactly how these kind of um, Republican values, for instance, in the in the uh, in France, the Kantian uh, scheme. In um, even though you, I know that you have all, all uh, that you have spoken about it. I just want to return to that. How exactly is it that a ethno-nationalist, colonial, fascist, race uh, race-based um, um, order is defended by a discourse that? proposes itself as a project of inclusivity. Who would like to go first? I volunteer. <laughs> Ivan? Oh. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I, I'll be honest. I don't know. Um, they, they, and, and, and that's and, the, and that maybe is bare, just playing. But um, I, I'd go back to the the. I think the the thing that uh, the idea that uh, I think drives me and compels me. I think if if a society, if a culture, if a culture has. Uh, built itself up on a whole lot of, if you'll forgive the French, on a whole lot of bullshit, which it has tended to believe and then enshrine. And then something comes to, um, a little wind comes to just unravel it. Um, it's left floundering in, in, in the particular pond. Um, I'm, 
and, and to put it more uh, in a kind of more positive way, I think if if the, if the work that uh, was being done around, uh, you know, for example, the po you know the postal work that was being done in in Germany had been done in the rest of the continent, the kind of examination of soul, um, the coming to peace and terms with uh, the, the, the terrible, terrible history of, of violence visited against peoples, um, then I believe then that society and perhaps the rest of the world would have come to a place of, um, I think, a, a realistic humanity. Um, that's built on 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 truthfulness. I didn't say truth. Truthfulness and a, and 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 a, and a humility uh, rather than this hubris um, that has then manifested in uh, you know the whole thing of the replacement of the gods. Um, but they also say that they whom the gods want to turn uh, want to want to destroy the first turn mad, and that's probably what's un unfolding right now. I mean, just to follow up on this, maybe uh, to you, Akil, um, because that concerns so much the question of what do we share, what is the construction of it, what is at stake in the construction of a possible ground, the kind of archives you are calling for that are not the imperial archives from which such common ground um, must be constructed. Is it not that thought that this particular memory culture you have mentioned, Yvonne, um, I, I, with all its achievements, may it not also have contributed to something that really, I think, is a major potential um, um, stumbling block um, for the discussion at hand, which is sort of the way in which Nazism um, has been sort of singled out as an exceptionality, as a deviation from, mm -hmm. from the proper course, from the proper mm -hmm. road mm -hmm. to modern progress, um, mm -hmm. as part of sort of the, the, the settlement um, the, of the post-war order. Mm -hmm. I don't... Akil, do you want to? Uh, Akil, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, no concept you are asking uh, very difficult questions. And uh, I, I, I even have to see that I have a clear kind of response to them, but I acknowledge that these are uh, very serious issues. I tend to believe that we will hardly find in the imperial archive, if we call it like that, any meaningful proposition um, in relation to what it is that we owe each other, in relation to what is common that we do. The imperial archive is fundamentally about creating differences and sparsing out and uh, dividing and building hierarchies. That's what it's all about, or that is what it's fundamentally about. Of course, there's an, a part of that imperial archive that um, doubles in the kinds of language we have been talking about here, justice, equality, commonality, but it's usually a commonality that is reserved to those who look alike. Mm -hmm. It's never, mm -hmm. it's hardly ever extended to those we could call the non-parents. And that is what makes it um, bad tool for those who would really want to reimagine the world or imagine a different kind of world in which everybody would be welcomed. A different kind of world that would carve out a space including for non-humans. 
So, so that is why I was suggesting that, not that we discard it entirely, because what is really interesting in the imperial archive is that we can turn it against itself. It has in itself enough resources to be turned against itself. And we have to do that, that work. But in order to escape what Zabina and Yvonne were referring to as the history of violence, um, the history of negation in its most ontological dimension, in order to escape it, we absolutely need to uh, draw on all the archives of the world on the mem all the memories of the world. Not in terms of one memory superseding every other memory, but in terms of the solidarity of memories, especially the solidarity of all the memories of human suffering. That is, in any case, what, when one looks into those traditions of thought coming from a part of the world. Traditions of thought developed by those who were at the receiving end of the violence Sabina and Yvonne were talking about, you will find that in those archives, they are alternative imaginations of how we could share uh, uh, this earth, this planet, which is the only one we have. In any case, so far, where life is, is, is possible. And, and in that sense, it seems to me that for those who would really want to counter the forces that are at work, the forces of dark enlightenment, which in fact have always been part of the enlightenment itself. The enlightenment has always had a nocturnal part. Mm -hmm. the, Illusion is to make us believe that it was all sunny. Mm. It was all solar. It was not always solar. It had a deep nocturnal part. And that nocturnal dimension of the enlightenment is what you see in the resurgence of white supremacism, <laughs> anti-black violence, mm. anti-Semitism, and other forms of uh, uh, trampling on the dignity of especially the weak and mm. the, the, the demand for, incredible demand for racism and for brutality mm. against the most vulnerable on earth, which we see uh, emerging. So in order to counter that, we need to uh, come up with a new idea of the extent to which we all have an equal moral entitlement to the earth. And uh, that's the necessity to have some, invent some kind of authority which defines the rules and boundaries of the occupation and the use of the commons. And that is what is lacking. And it's only in this way that we will supplement the Kantian model of cosmopolitanism I was criticizing early on. That, that's what I think in any case. And Sabine, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would get a few remarks. Yes, I'd like to add a few comments. Um, we started off, Anselm, with a question of why it is still the case case that in the global north this racist eliminating order is something that we are clinging to and I think all three of us have talked about that and I'd right, like to emphasize some points. You spoke of colonial melancholy. The global north and very 
we in North America and Europe even more so happen to be living in a stage of um, denialism, of denying uh, the violence that has happened. More than 50 years ago, James Baldwin also already spoke about it. It's the innocence that constitutes the crime, is what he said. And basically, that uh, is true until today. Until today, in the global north, in the white west, we managed to act as if we had nothing to do with any of that, in a, in a way. And we believe, and this has been touched on also, we believe that it is possible for liberal ideas to be generalized for everyone. And until today, we ignore that universalism was a violence-shaped particular um, approach that it is based on giving up exclusive solidarity and reciprocity and that uh, not everyone was meant in the French uh, Revolution deliberately so with fr freedom and equality. Not everybody was allowed or had the option of being brothers and uh, not everybody wanted to be fraternal. So I believe we need um, a new foundation for solidarity where solidarity is not something that is exclusive and I believe the what we have inherited on the basis of history so far has trained us in exclusive, excluding forms of solidarity. I'd also like to touch on uh, the culture of remembrance. And um, I fully agree with what Achille said, that it is the entire knowledge of the world that we need if we want to save the world. In Berlin, for some time now, we've um, had a discussion regarding the restitution of uh, stolen cultural goods. And I touched on this briefly. If we want to be capable of uh, truly accessing the entire archive, then there can be no alternative to restitution. And understanding that um, the fact that what are aesthetic artifacts in our museums now, ethnological artifacts in our museums, that they have been stolen and that this robbery, in fact, was a destruction of culture and a destruction of knowledge um, it has to be accepted. Now, restitution is a very complex matter, but that's one um, example, as far as I'm concerned, of this form of denialism, of this ignorance that we find ourselves in in the West. In, on German TV just recently, a few days ago, a court, for instance, um, found regarding the Berlin Humboldt Forum, where there are artifacts from Asian cultures, African cultures, which now for the first time we will be able to show the world, but not a word is said about how they came to us. That's how we put, they came to us. And so if that is the state of the debate, the status of how we talk about these things today, then we have uh, quite a long road ahead of us on the way towards unlearning the culture of dominance that I spoke about. It's not about just, well, let's put on a new sweater. It's about very the very fundamental work of uh, recognizing and unlearning patterns and the subjectivity related to dominance and um, uh, that we have been socialized in for more than five centuries. Thank you. Um, I just a quick remark, we'll go on for another like 10 plus a few minutes. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Riyad now to perhaps uh, join us quickly um, to sum up maybe some of the many, many questions we've received um, uh, to allow us maybe to at least address a few of them. Uh. Yeah, hi, my name is Riyad from Medico. I'm working here in the background together with a few colleagues because there are numerous questions. Um, 
thanks to all the presenters. Thanks also to you, Anselm. Um, I'd like maybe to try and uh, sort them in, in first to clarify certain terms that came as questions from the audience regarding certain terms or concepts. And the second one, because that was also what the moderator has been promising for today, um, that we would turn more to practical aspects on how to implement, how to change, how to do, how to come, how to make this change uh, to happen. So uh, the, the first question actually goes to Akhil. And um, Regina asks you um, if you could elaborate on the differences between what you called um, the colonial paradoxon as opposed to contemporary architecture. So what does the colonial paradoxon consist of. Um, there's a second question um, that would also be for you, Achil. Um, namely, to, if, if we, this is from Siegfried, I just read the question to you. The causes of what many call underdevelopment, equating it primarily with poverty, are usually described as economic phenomena, exploitation, economic subordination, etc. But what importance do you, Akhil, give to culture, especially in comparison to economy, and the destructive impact of colonialism, imperialism, and racism on culture, cultures, in brackets? Um, and then there is a question that is directed to Yvonne that is going more into the practical question. I think in the second round of questions, I can maybe elaborate on this a bit. Um, the question is very basic, how to rebuild the world, what to do with this past, or more accurately, with these various pasts and narratives, and could you elaborate on the character of reparations, someone is interested, who repairs, and how? <clears throat> Achille, do you want to address the first two questions? Okay, I, I, I will try. There are many paradoxes uh, uh, embedded in, in the modern colonial project. Um, but the, the most important, uh, in my opinion, has to do with the um, the, uh, the belief uh, which is intrinsic to the colonial project, the belief that um, the world belongs to, to Europe. I'm talking about European colonialism, uh, in particular in the Americas and uh, in, in Africa. Uh, I have in particular in mind I mean, the, uh, the partition of the continent uh, during the, uh, the famous uh, conference, in fact, uh, uh, in, in Berlin. Since the 15th century, that is the fact, the question is, who is it that the earth belong, belong to? And between the 15th century and the 19th century, Europe convinces itself and the rest of the world that in fact, the earth belongs to her. And colonial appropriation rests precisely on that uh, uh, false predicate according to which um, we, we are not, not all um, nations or if you want to use such a word, cultures, or even worse, civilizations, not all of them have a moral equal entitlement to the earth. So the key paradox of, of colonialism is, uh, lies in the implications that not all humans stand on equal grounds in relation to the earth, its resources, uh, its benefits. That is the key contradiction. 
And from there, everything else unfolds. Appropriation of people, Yvonne mentioned it, 400 years, she didn't use the term, but she was referring partly to the whole Atlantic slave trade, the predation of bodies, the predation of resources, all of which have led to making parts of our world and parts of the continent uninhabitable. The question then being, how is it that we render the world habitable once again? It seems to me that that's what is at the heart of the conversation we are having. Mm -hmm. How do we make our planet, our world, habitable again for everybody and for everything? How do we learn once again to live with the earth and with each other? If you want to put it, let's say, positively. So that's how I understand, let's say, the paradox of colonialism to render the earth and inhabitable to many. Now, in terms of uh, underdevelopment, you see, these are uh, categories, frankly, myself, I hardly ever use them. Uh, things like uh, underdevelopment, like poverty, uh, all that uh, language, that vocabulary, that lexicon, which hides more than it reveals. Um, and the concept of underdevelopment, I don't even know whether it's used again these days. Uh, it used to be used a lot in the 70s, 60s. I think they have moved to something. They have to, you know, they have to recycle those terms constantly. Uh, yesterday it was under development, today sustainable development, and tomorrow something else. Um, so, so we shouldn't take them too, too seriously because they hide the key processes that are, are at work. Now, more interesting is what you, uh, the, the question uh, puts under uh, the, uh, the term, uh, the role of colonialism in the destruction of culture. Yes, of course it did, uh, yeah. And Zabina was talking about the, the, the artifacts that are housed in, in Western museums. It's not uh, simply the artifacts. Behind the artifacts, I mean, huge knowledge, <clears throat> knowledge of, of plants, knowledge of other species, um, you have uh, uh, all kinds of crafts behind one artifact. Uh, you have uh, um, uh, uh, chains of uh, uh, communication between the living and the dead and, uh, and the cosmos at large, entire worldviews that were, were, were broken. Um, people were left with the... Uh, uh, objectal support uh, for writing their own existence uh, in continuity with generations that came before, generations coming uh, after the whole capacity to reproduce life, to, to get life going on, uh, point I started with. That's what is at stake. Uh, I don't even mention the bones. Zabina mentioned them. Uh, there is no Western ethnographic museum, which is not built on African bones. Bones. Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? What does a term such as restitution entail when, in fact, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what is at stake is indeed our bodily uh, 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 integrity. So it's all of those issues. Uh, um, the crippling of the imagination uh, by the forces of, of theft and, and, and rape and, and predation, which are still going on, of course. They are going on in, in, in an even more accelerated way because colonialism nowadays is, I would argue, techno-molecular. Uh, we are, have entered a new epoch of techno-molecular colonialism in the sense that it insinuates itself in the very fibers of, of life. Life itself seen 
under uh, the strictures of neoliberalism as something to be bought and sold, which makes some of us argue, at least metaphorically, uh, about the becoming black of the world. Uh, that now, um, we used to be the only ones who were bought and sold, but now they, <laughs> we are threatened to become black. Uh, I don't know what to make of it, but, but if you want, I mean, those are the kinds of issues uh, that preoccupy a number of us uh, in, in the continent uh, and, and elsewhere. Thank you, Achille. I think particularly for also opposing so clearly the question of habitability, planetary habitability to the two concepts of property and ownership and their imperial roots, because I think that is something that is really urgent to understand better in this whole discussion about reconstruction is the material the dialectical entanglement the material base or relationship um, that you know the degree to which the whole discourses of the human of reason um, of freedom are predicated on material relations of ownership and self-ownership and those who supposedly lack propensity for ability of etc and no? also this entire dark side of which some of the enlightenment of which some would just wish that it finally just disappears of course cannot disappear without understanding the material predicates um yvonne do you want to address the question that was posed to you okay um you know thank you thank you for the question um look what what do we do? I, I, you know, uh, we can answer that question. Uh, um, the same number of people in the world have, will probably have a response to that particular question. Um, uh, I, I'd still maintain that to the, the starting point is what I think the Jesuits call an examination of conscience, both individual, societal, and cultural. Uh, the daring to look within, um, to to, to confront the darkness, to confront the demons, um, to, to bring them out. They're not that frightening, even though they're awful. To be able to say, yes, uh, great-grandpa was a real so-and-so. Um, and, and, and to, to be able to articulate that which hurts the, 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 the person within and, and then to present it to the offended party, um, to, to speak it uh, and, and to trust that within the, in the process of the pronunciation, there might be forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is not guaranteed, but it can be a hope. That would be a place to begin the deep conversations that we actually uh, needed to have uh, and we have longed to have. From that place of possibility, the imagination is liberated. Uh, those of us who are artists, I would love to work with a whole group of, uh, of people to imagine, um, um, to, you know, create a story for and and film the possibility of, of, of the world that that is dreamt um, and, and to put it out there and the artist can do that and everyone in their particular areas um, can can explore what mm, the possibility of the called in future um, um, looks a, looks like um, um, and, and, so, and, and a, a very practical way of uh, how, how to begin the repair is look um, though those items those stolen items in the museums do not belong to Europe find a way to bring them back there should be no politics about the restoration and it doesn't matter where they go it's actually none of your business uh, but the stolen goods need to be returned but if they're not going to be stolen if they're not going to be returned then stop pretending um, that there's any interest in doing anything to say that yes as part of our cultural imperative is that is, uh, we are thieves uh, and that is part of who we are uh, and, and then we can move on you see we can move on rather than have this thing um, lurking between us um, that, that generates all sorts of resentments and 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 endless conversations um, I'll stop there because I know we're running out of time but there was another question as who 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 repairs um, in the Catholic uh, confession no, the one who repairs is the one who feels the cons he, his or her conscience struck the most. The one who becomes very aware of, of a wound that needs to be repaired, needs to be satisfied. Um, 
and and again that you know we're talking about planetary consciousness but individual consciousness becomes very important in the in the in the trajectory of who repairs and it's not not necessarily restricted to to say the european uh, we too have our own areas in which repair is needed um, as africans as kenyans or as individuals in the world thank you um Yvonne, Michel and Sabina um an apology to uh, everybody else that we went over time um, or that we took away some of the um, lunch break time. Um, to my understanding, the uh, um, afternoon session resumes at the time that is indicated. I think that's the only way also technically um, because there might be a whole other group of participants or listeners joining in. Um, but it still gives you almost an hour of a lunch break right now. Um, uh, before uh, the, the lecture of Susan Buck Morris, the need and desire to make world history again. Um, a very warm thank you. And of course, we could have gone into many more details. It was really a very uh, generous uh, and instructive panel. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, these conversations continue in another form very soon. So thank you again, Sabine, Yvonne, and Achil. Um, and uh, wishing you all a very nice lunch break now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anselm, and thank you, Sabine and Achille. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.